you want me to, to share straight away or do you want to sort of start and then I'll share? Um, well, we I can introduce we can, yeah, we can start off right away or I think yeah, Luke was going to join us, but if not, then I can probably give an introduction and then Professor Evans can take over and just we'll have the Q&A right after. <laughs> okay, I'll you leave it in your join. hands and I'll, I'll share as soon as you uh, tell me to. We're live, by the way. So. Oh, we're live. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, can you Hello. hear me? Yes, Luke, we can hear you. Hello. Hello. Excellent. Hello, Professor Evans. Um, so uh, this is our fourth talk of the series. Um, we, we hope that you are going to enjoy this one just as much as the rest. Uh, Professor Evans is very, very kindly uh, uh, volunteered to, to give this talk for us uh, and we're really really looking forward to it so without uh, much further ado I'll pass you over to Professor Evans thank you. Thank you very much Luke. Okay so um, welcome and thanks for joining I'm just going to start sharing my slides there's always a slight delay when this happens um, but hopefully it will appear soon and if we go okay so hopefully um, you can see that and uh, hear me well. Um, so the, the full title is Recreating the Big Bang with Alice at the CERN LHC. So um, I apologize. Let me just get my laser pointer working. Um, I apologize for the rather glib title, um, but I was told it had to begin with R. Um, obviously, what I'm doing is is not recreating uh, the Big Bang, because, as you know, that would be a disaster. Um, but what we do do is recreate the kind of conditions that existed um, just a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. So um, not that I've been here for a while, but uh, in Switzerland, situated um, on the Swiss French border near Geneva, is the world's largest physics laboratory called CERN, uh, possibly the world's largest laboratory uh, full stop. Here's, here's an aerial view. We see the Alps here, so very popular in the winter with my research students. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is what we've built about 100 meters underground. And there we've built what's probably the world's largest and most complicated machine. It's a particle accelerator called the Large Hadron Collider or the LHC. And this can accelerate subatomic particles to point 99999991 times the speed of light, at least with my calculation. Obviously, any particle with mass uh, can't travel at the speed of light because one would need an infinite amount of energy, but we're getting quite close with this. And then what we do is we collide these beams of particles together in four huge caverns situated around this 27 kilometer ring. And when we do that, every time we collide these particles, we get subatomic explosions um, that recreate the kind of conditions that would have existed around about a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. And these explosions are happening in four massive particle detectors and up to 600 million times per second. So an obvious question is why have thousands of physicists and engineers from across the globe got together to build this. So uh, in spite of rumors, it's not that we had some kind of bet to see the maximum amount of money we could extract from our governments and then decide what to do with it. Um, what we want to do, our goal, is to know what everything in the universe is made from on the most fundamental level and how it works, how it interacts. So we basically want to know the meaning of life, the universe and everything, and who doesn't. So I thought we would start where we're all comfortable um, with atoms. And as you know, the whole visible universe are made from atoms and atoms consist of a positive nucleus containing practically all of the mass of an atom, something like 99.98%. And then there's a cloud of electrons around it. And the average diameter of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So one can imagine if you had a string of atoms, uh, 10 million atoms long, then that string would just be a millimeter long. So atoms are pretty small. Um, here's a kind of artist's impression, if you like, of, of a helium atom. 
uh, the kind of picture of an atom that I would have been exposed to at school, obviously without the animation or indeed color. Um, and this model is, is rubbish. First of all, electrons don't orbit the nucleus like planets orbit a star, it's much more complicated, but also the scale is completely wrong. This nucleus that contains practically all of the mass, its diameter is about 10,000 times smaller than the atom itself. You wouldn't even see the nucleus if, if this was to scale. And as you all know, the nuclei themselves consist of positively charged protons and electrical neutral neutrons. And at one stage, these were believed to be fundamental particles like the electron. But now we know they're not fundamental and these protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. And on the basic level, they're made up of three quarks. So um, in terms of our elementary particles, protons and neutrons are made up of two different types of quarks, which are called up and down. And of course, this instantly tells you that physicists are not very good at naming particles. But there you are, we are, we are stuck with up and down. And these quarks have a fractional electric charge uh, in comparison to the charge of an electron. So the up quark has two thirds of the electric charge of a proton and the down quark has um, a third of the charge of an electron. And you can see uh, a proton is made up of two ups and a down, giving it an overall charge of plus one. And a neutron is made up of two downs and an up, giving it no overall net charge. And although uh, quarks and electrons are, are very different particles, they feel different fields and different forces, um, this is exact. It's not approximate, it's exact. Without that, atoms couldn't exist. So there still is a deeper underlying theory that should explain this that we don't know yet. Now this model of a proton is, is rather simplistic. And in fact, a proton with any energy would look something like this. We would still have our three, what we call valence quarks, but it'll be full of a sea of quarks, anti-quarks and gluons. So the inside structure of a proton, certainly one with any energy, is much more complicated than that simple model of three quarks. But anyway, we've got our, our quarks and so, we actually have a family of particles. We've got the up quark and the down quark that make up nuclei, and of course the electron that completes the atom. But also, I haven't mentioned it, but in this family is the electron neutrino. And stars, including our sun, and the fusion processes that go on in the core, trillions and trillions and trillions of neutrinos are produced. In fact, as I'm speaking, there's over a trillion neutrinos going through every one of us every second. However, they just go straight through us. Most of them go straight through the Earth. Now, in terms of the mass of these particles, there's no point in me giving you the mass in kilograms or solar masses or anything like that, because it's just a ridiculously small number. So here's the mass relative to the mass of a single proton or relative to the mass of a single hydrogen atom, if you like. So you can see the up quark is about 300 times lighter than a proton. The down is about 150. Electron is about 2,000 times lighter. And initially, uh, people thought the neutrinos were massless, like photons, but there now is evidence that they do have mass, but it's never been uh, measured directly. So certainly the neutrin electron neutrino is at least 100 million times less massive than a proton. And in terms of the first three particles, these here, the whole visible universe is made up of these three particles. So um, anyone that studied chemistry at A level, and um, obviously you shouldn't be embarrassed about that, at least chemistry is a proper science. Um, that whole complicated periodic table, which of course you all know and memorize uh, by heart, and all that complexity is just uh, created by rearranging these three particles in different ways. So it's kind of simplified this complicated periodic table. Now it turns out that nature supplies us with two extra families of particles and these are much heavier. So there's a second type of neutrino called the mu neutrino. There's a heavy electron called the muon, about 200 times heavier. There's the strange quark and the charm quark. There's a third type of neutrino. There's a super heavy electron called the tau. There's the bottom quark. We're getting desperate for names at this stage. 
Um, and for these particles, I don't know the mass of the neutrinos, but for these particles, if you imagine these are three dimensional spheres, then I've made their relative volumes uh, the same as their relative masses. And of course, there's the sixth quark, which is the top quark. And this single quark is, is actually heavier than, than a gold atom. Now, we don't know why nature supplies us with these extra families, but they do. And there's certain processes that actually make them rather important. Um, what's irritating is there's no mass, there's no pattern to, to their mass. So even when we discovered all of these except the top, nobody could predict what the mass of the top quark was, apart from it was heavier than the bottom. There's no pattern, and that's rather disturbing. As, as physicists, we like to have a theory that at least would predict um, how this pattern, or at least explain this pattern of their masses, but we don't know. What we do know is any particles that are made up of these are unstable and quickly decay into particles made up of lighter um, quarks, and they will decay into particles made up of up and downs, electrons, photons, etc. So stable matter is made up of up and down quarks. Obviously, for those in the physics department, there are uh, some of this still exists amongst academic staff, um, but we won't go there. So those are the particles, that's the matter particles. What about the forces? Well, as far as we know, there's four, just four fundamental forces. There's gravity that we all know and love, responsible for the formation of galaxies, keeps the earth going around the sun and us attached to the earth. There's the electromagnetic force, which is not just responsible for electric and magnetic fields, it's responsible for the formation and the properties of atoms, so the whole of chemistry, and also for life itself. Life is dependent on the electromagnetic force. Then there's the weak interaction, the weak force, and this is responsible for certain types of radioactive decay called beta decay. And what's basically happening is that a down quark in a neutron is turning into an up quark and emitting an electron and an anti-neutrino. Um, so a neutron turns into a proton um, it's mediated this force by a, a virtual W boson, and I'll mention that later. And in case there's any smart Alex there, this should be um, an anti-neutrino here, though it's drawn as a neutrino. Not just, um, the weak force is not just responsible for uh, beta decay, also the fusion processes in stars also is dependent on the weak force. And finally, my favorite force, and the one that I study, is the strong force, and this force, even the residual Nate part of this force is strong enough to bind all those protons and neutrons together in nuclei, but this force also is responsible for holding uh, and imprisoning those quarks inside protons and neutrons. Now on the sort of subatomic level, the strong force, as the name suggests, is about 10,000 times stronger than the electromagnetic force, and the weak force is about a hundred times weaker. Gravity, on the other hand, on the subatomic level, is about roughly 10 to the 35 times weaker than electromagnetism. So gravity is, is a tiny, tiny force. Um, you need huge objects like planets and things to really uh, feel the force of gravity. So completely irrelevant on the particle scale. And there is there has been people that even suggested that there are extra dimensions that gravity uh, leaks into to try and explain why it's so weak compared with the other fundamental forces, but I won't go into um, that. So those are the forces, but um, how do particles feel a force? So if I had uh, an electron here minding its own business, and then I put another electron next to it, um, because they're both negatively charged, they will repel. But the question is, how does one electron know the other one is there? Um, for there to be any kind of force, there has to be an exchange of information. And in our theory, that exchange of information is carried out by what we call virtual carrier particles. And depending on the type of the force, we would have different virtual carrier particles. So for example, and I hope you can see this and it shows up, for the electromagnetic force, if I had two electrons say here, and they interact, then what carries that force are virtual photons. Here's a simple uh, Feynman diagram with just a single photon, but it could be more complicated than that. It could be multiple photons, etc. 
And the reason why they're called virtual particles is because they violate the conservation of energy and indeed momentum as well. So although we all know that on average, uh, energy and momentum have to be conserved, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics actually allows you to violate the conservation of energy, providing you do it so quickly that nobody notices. I have a similar philosophy when it comes to robbing banks. You can get away with it if nobody notices. But what, the, oh, this is stopped. Um, and the more energy you borrow, the quicker you have to pay it back. So what happens here is this electron can borrow energy from the vacuum, um, create this virtual photon, and then it's paid back to the vacuum. And the time you're allowed to borrow energy from the vacuum is inversely proportional to the amount of energy you borrow. And this number here is Planck's constant divided by two pi, so it's a very small number. So something like if, if I created um, a virtual proton out of thin air, I would have to repay that energy in about 10 to the minus 23 seconds or something, 24 seconds. Um, and this is not just a model that we've created to explain forces. Um, space itself, the space between galaxies is not empty. It's full of virtual particles and antiparticles popping in and out of existence the whole time. And although they can't be directly observed, they do exert a pressure which is known as the vacuum pressure. Um, and, and that can be observed. So this, this really uh, seems to be a, a true model of how forces work. And then of course there's antimatter. So every fundamental particle has an antimatter partner. And these have the same mass, but opposite electric charge, uh, and indeed color charge. So um, an electron's antimatter partner would be the positron, and for each type of quark, there's an antimatter equivalent. And if we have a particle and an antiparticle, let's say each of mass capital M, and we put them together, they will annihilate and their mass will be converted into energy. Okay, and we even know, obviously, from Einstein's, um, so if they're at rest, then the energy is just mc squared. We could even work that out. So here's my quark antiquark. And there you have it experimentally proven that they annihilate. Now, what I do is the opposite. I take huge amounts of energy and I convert that energy into mass. So I create matter. Um, in my experiments at CERN. And of course, when I create matter, there's a symmetry, so I create equal amounts of antimatter as well. Now, if we go back to the forces, so those of you that have um, just finished your first years, this could give you some nightmarish flashbacks to my lecture course um, last year. But as you know, with the electromagnetic force, and we're just considering the static case of electric charges, we've got one type of charge and then we've got its opposite charge, its anti-charge. So we've got negative and positive, or positive and negative, depending on your point of view. And these are mediated by photons. And as you know, photons themselves do not have an electric field, they do not have electric charge. So um, the potential energy between two charges um, at a distance r of a part drops off at a rate of one over r. Um, so what this means is in the classical sense, if we look at these field lines here, the field lines spread out with distance, and it means the force between two charges gets less and less as I pull them apart uh, until you can't hardly feel the force at all. Now, the strong interaction is a lot more complicated. So there are something called color charges, which we call them that in analogy to the electric charges, but with the strong force, there are three color charges called red, green, and blue, and the quarks carry those, and the anti-quarks carry anti-color, anti-red, anti-green, anti-blue. So we have three times as many charges with the strong force, and the strong force is mediated by gluons, and there are eight types of gluons. And what makes the strong force so complicated is the gluons themselves carry color charge, which means the gluons can interact with each other. So what this means is if I have two colored objects here, so I have a quark, say, and an anti-quark, and um, if I look at the field lines, they don't spread out as much as with the um, electromagnetic case. 
um, the the gluons here will, will interact with each other and they actually pull each other down uh, into more of a tube. And then if I was to create, create grab hold of my quark and anti-quark and try and pull them apart, then this tube stretches into something more like a string of gluons. Um, and if I keep pulling and pulling, eventually the energy builds up in this string um, is enough to create another quark anti-quark pair. So as I try and pull quarks and anti-quarks apart, all I end up with is more and more particles. So if I produced a high energy quark and anti-quark in a collision, flying off in opposite directions, I don't see the quarks in my detector, I see two jets um, of particles because the, the strings keep snapping um, and we create more and more particles. So it turns out, and they haven't been seen, people have looked on, that you don't get free quarks. Free quarks have never been um, observed because of this effect. And the potential energy between quarks, um, well, at low distances, it still has this one over R term, but at longer distances, it's dominated by this linear term. And this linear term means that, obviously, as R goes to infinity, the potential energy goes to infinity, so one would need an infinite amount of energy to have a free object with colour. So we can't have that. So Free particles must have no net color. And we can create them by either having three quarks, one of each color, and that's called a baryon. An example of that would be the proton or the neutron. Or we can have a quark anti quark pair where we have a color and an anti color, and this is known as a meson, for example, the pi. And the theory that explains strong interactions is called quantum chromodynamics, which is a bit of a mouthful for anybody. So we generally just refer to it as QCD. Now, the other thing is, if you remembered a few slides ago, um, which would be impressive, uh, I gave you the mass of these quarks in, in terms of the proton mass. And as you can see, most people would agree, maybe mathematicians would debate it, but most people can agree that 0 0.003 plus 0 0.003 plus 0 0.006 does not equal one. So the bare mass of the quarks does not add up to the mass of the proton. And it seems that quarks have a much higher effective mass when they're confined in a particle. And in fact, the mass of the quarks, which comes from the interaction with the Higgs field, only accounts for about 1% of the proton or neutron mass. And the rest is due to the strong force. It's the strong force, that force that's imprisoning those uh, quarks um, that generates the mass. And that's one of the things uh, I'm working on to try and work out how that works. But basically, 99% approximately of the mass of the visible universe is due to the strong force. So if anyone's been piling on those lockdown pounds in the last few months, don't worry about it, because whatever your mass is, Remember that 99% of that number is purely down to the strong force. Just, just blame the strong force. It's just physics. So, as I said, um, particles, quarks have to exist inside of these um, hadrons, as we call them, either the baryon or the meson. However, the theory suggests that if we go to really extreme temperatures and or densities, hadronic matter itself, or if you like, nuclear matter, melts into a plasma of free quarks and gluons. And actually it's not a plasma, it's called a quark gluon plasma, but it's more of a soup of free quarks, anti-quarks and gluons. And this state of matter um, is believed to have existed right at the beginning of the universe and, and existed this sort of primordial soup up to about 10 microseconds after the Big Bang. By that stage, the early universe had cooled down enough for protons and neutrons to start forming. And there are some theories that suggest that the quark gluon plasma could be formed, a cold, dense one, um, in, the, in the center of collapsing neutron stars. So it, it's rather difficult to, there are theories about that, it's rather difficult to measure that effect at the moment. So this is um, what I study. Uh, it's the closest you can get to studying free quarks. So the question is, how do you make one? Well, we create them by colliding ultra-relativistic heavy ions. And you can see I've been clever here and put in the, uh, 
uh, length contraction here. So you're effectively colliding two dimensional objects because the LHC energies, um, the radius of the um, ions is about 7,000 times greater than the, thick, the, the effective thickness. So you're basically colliding two dimensional objects. And when you do that, <coughs> excuse me, although a lot of the energy carries on going, um, when you create these two heavy ions, collide them together, um, a, a tiny, super hot, dense fireball is produced. Now, this doesn't last long enough to be able to probe it with anything. So we have to probe it with the particles and antiparticles that are produced in this collision. And by measuring different properties and different particles, we find out different things about what's going on. We also use proton, proton and proton lead collisions as a baseline to, to compare where we don't expect a quark gluon plasma to form. So it's used as a baseline. Now, obviously, we need a particle accelerator. Here's an artist's impression of the LHC. Here's an actual photograph, not quite so clean. Um, in these blue tube, uh, tubes here, this is where the particles are. There's two beams in there, two beam lines, where particles go one direction and the other direction, uh, surrounded by magnets. And the white tube here are the cryogenic. So there's supercooled liquid helium flowing through these white tubes. Now at the moment <coughs> it's switched off because we're in the upgrade phases so you can walk around the LHC tunnel um, but when it's switched on when particles go around in circles they give off something called synchrotron radiation and it's so high in the LHC tunnel that certainly um, no one is allowed down there. I mean to give you an idea people usually get a bit funny about radiation um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of Chernobyl, okay, so Chernobyl is for wimps. I, I take my kids there camping just to toughen them up, to be honest with you, and, and it saves on hairdresser bills as well. Um, but you, you could, unless you actually strapped yourself to the reactor, you could go camping in Chernobyl for a year and slightly increase your chances of getting cancer 20 years later. Um, there's parts of the LH, LHC tunnel when it's switched on, that if you were there for 24 hours, you are guaranteed death um, within a week. So that there's phenomenal, I'm not even allowed to send students down there when it's running. So there's, there's phenomenal levels of radiation down there. So I've got some facts for you. As I said, this it's a 27 kilometer circumference accelerator. And of course, each proton will lap this accelerator over 11,000 times a second. And we can have something like 300 trillion protons in the beam, which means the total energy of the beam is about a third of a gigajoule. To give you an idea, that's equivalent to a 100 ton train traveling at 100 miles an hour. So if you want to imagine the moment that you're standing on the railway tracks, uh, which you shouldn't be because it's locked down, but if you're standing on the railway tracks and you had a train coming straight at you at 100 miles an hour, so you might think oh, that's a lot of energy, but then imagine all of that energy in that train squeezed down to a beam the width of a human hair, and that's the LHC beam. If this thing goes off course, it could drill a hole through 100 meters of concrete. So the engineers and applied physicists that control the LHC have to be extremely careful. They're not allowed to play Star Wars with it or anything like that because it would chop my detector in half. And all around, that, that, that whole 27 uh, kilometer circumference, the, the magnets that bend the particles are cooled to just 1.9 Kelvin, so it's colder than outer space. And we want our particles to be hitting each other inside detectors, not hitting beam gas. So the vacuum is, is, is around 10 to the minus 13 atmospheres. To give you an idea what that is, if you were in a spaceship halfway between planet Earth and planet Mars, and you wound down the window, um, this is the vacuum that you would very briefly experience as you exploded. So this is the Alice detector or cutaway image. So um, she's 16 meters across and 26 meters long, weighs 10,000 tons, which evidently is, is more than the Eiffel Tower. And um, if I include everybody, uh, academics, research students, uh, technicians, engineers, uh, IT specialists, where there's almost 
2,000 people working on this project from 174 institutes in 39 different countries. So it really is a truly uh, international experiment. And of course, we have this huge magnet and then a, a whole onion structure of different types of detectors that tell us different things. And when we put all the information together, um, we know what's happening in these collisions. So there's beams coming this way and that way, and they collide in the center. Obviously, the most important part is the Birmingham built central trigger processor. This is the sort of electronic brain of the detector that tells all the components what to do. And if this didn't work, then Alice would be the most expensive piece of modern art ever built. And they would still be looking for my body. But fortunately, it, it does work. So at the LHC, we collide protons uh, together at most of the year, which you need the data, but then for the last four weeks of each year, we collide uh, lead ions together. And these are some event displays. You see thousands of particles and antiparticles being produced. And I like to call those because when we do that, every time we, we do that, we create a little tiny drop of the early universe. Um, I like to say that we're creating mini big bangs in these collisions. The, the main reason I like to say it is that it, it winds up my wife a little bit. Um, my, my wife's got an English degree, you see, and she's pointed out that a mini big bang is just a bang. But, but anyway, I'm, I'm sticking to this. And um, also when we do this, um, no killer strangelets are produced. So unless asked, I won't, that's a whole different story, um, but clearly any particle whose first name is killer is best avoided. So uh, coming to the end, probably overshot terribly. Um, obviously we've produced over 300 papers and most of them are incomprehensible to anybody that's not on the experiment, but um, our analysis tell us that we create the highest temperatures and densities ever produced in any experiment. And we've measured that, give you an idea in this fireball, the temperatures are over 400,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. And uh, this fireball is more than 50 times denser than a neutron star. So the, apart from a black hole, this is the most dense thing um, there is out there. Uh, to give you an idea, a, a cubic centimeter of this stuff would have a mass of 40 billion tons. Although if you had a cubic centimeter of this stuff, you would destroy the entire planet. And bizarrely, in spite of this huge density and temperature, our analysis shows that this cork long plasma behaves like a, an, an ideal liquid. So there's a theoretical expression of what a perfect liquid is. And this is closer, it's very close to the quantum limit. So it's the most perfect liquid ever produced in any experiment. So perhaps the early universe was really born from a perfect liquid. So in summary, by recreating the conditions that existed just after the Big Bang, um, we are probing the nature of this quark gluon plasma, this exotic state of matter. And by doing that, we're learning more about the strong force, more about QCD, but also more about the evolution of the very early universe. As you can imagine, there's still many, many outstanding questions, which also makes it fun and exciting to work on. And Birmingham is playing uh, an important role in this project. So it's an exciting journey. Uh, we've discovered lots of interesting things and these discoveries will continue for years to come, especially when the LHC restarts again after the long shutdown. So thank you very much for your patience and for listening. Excellent, thank you, Professor Evans. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, we are now uh, going to be inviting uh, the audience members to come and join this chat uh, and, and ask any questions. So the, the link should be in the chat and in the video description. Uh, so please come along and join us. Um, we will let you in uh, very shortly. And if you have any questions, please feel free to use the raise uh, hand function. Uh, and that will notify uh, the panelists, the rest of the committee, and they will uh, enable you to ask any questions. Thank you. I guess they can also type their questions if they want to um, as well. They can ask or type whatever they prefer. I guess while we wait for, I'm sorry, Luke. That's all right. 
Um, so yeah, the, as Professor Evan said, um, the, the questions can also be typed either in the YouTube chat uh, or if you wish to, to join the Zoom call but use the chat function in there, um, you may type the, the questions in that chat function too. I guess while we wait for some questions for the audience, I have a couple of questions that we could start off the discussion with, perhaps. <laughs> I'm bracing myself. <laughs> I'm going to start off with something quite, I guess, um, basic or straightforward, I guess, that perhaps our viewers might be interested in. Uh, why is the LHC a circular detector? Why did they opt for a circular design rather than a linear de design? Um, because to, to, to get to full energy, the beam has to keep getting a kick. And the circular design, it means that the particles can go round and round and round getting kicked for um, you know, a number of minutes until it gets up to the right energy. So if we made it linear, it would have to be much bigger than 27 kilometers. So um, that, that's, that's the, the main reason, um, really. It just have to be longer. If, if it, if it's longer. it also okay. means um, that you can have multiple detectors because if you had a linear one, so you'd have like two linear colliders, you'd have one detector in the middle. But by having it circular, you can have multiple detectors doing different physics. So it, it makes it much, um, um, you know, a much broader physics base that, that, that can happen there. That sounds perfect. It looks like we have a question uh, on the YouTube chat. So I'm going to read that out for, for you, Professor Evans. Um, does lattice field theory enable QFT calculations without the need of using virtual particles? Uh, well, uh, yeah, so lattice calculations um, those is, I see, it sounds like the person's asking the question knows more about lattice uh, QCD than I do. Yeah, so it's basically um, splitting up space time in, into small um, little, little amounts uh, on, on, a, on a computer, basically, and within that solving the QCD Lagrangian. So um, locally so it's 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 not using the concept of vertical part of virtual particles as such i think but but as far as i know lattice calculations don't say that you don't need virtual particles okay thank you very much uh, that that sounds like it's probably going to be the the hardest question you'll you'll have to ask answer i reckon um it doesn't look like we have any more questions at the moment so i'm going to ask uh ask you a question that links a little bit into some of the previous talks we've had. So some of our previous talks have been uh, on cosmology. Um, and the, the question for you then is, if um, neutrinos are indeed, uh, do have masses, uh, what kind of implications could that have? Um, and what sort of limits would these have and would they be different for the different types of neutrinos? So what's interesting is, <clears throat> so we know that there's at least what we know is from neutrino oscillations, there is a mass difference between the electron neutrino and the muon neutrino. So therefore, at least one of them has to have a mass. And so the assumption is, is if one of them's got a mass, they've all got a mass. Now, what, what's interesting is that with these different families, as you go up the families, the mass increases, whether you're talking about the quarks or you know, the electron, going to the muon and the tau. Um, it's not clear at the moment whether that hierarchy is the same for neutrinos. And in fact, the current data, it fits slightly better being inverted, that the electron neutrino is the heaviest and the others are lighter. But there's big errors in the data. But I don't, in terms of things like dark matter, I don't think neutrinos have enough mass to be able to explain um, dark matter, for example. So I think that's, that's not related. <coughs> but I think that if, if, if the mass, the way it goes is opposite to the way the other particles goes, that, that's, that's extremely interesting, it would open up um, a whole load of debate in other areas of physics. That's brilliant. No, th thank you very much for that answer. 
I, I can only imagine just how much uh, that would that would lead to a lot of uh, extra study uh, if if the relationship was to be inverted. Yes, yes. I mean, there's already theories out there to explain how it would be, but um, <clears throat> theorists don't waste any time when it comes to these things. But um, it would certainly be interesting. Yes. I've got uh, another question that I probably could ask if we don't have any questions so far from the other chats. Perfect. Uh, I was just wondering, since we discussed briefly about virtual photons, uh, would the virtual photons obey CPT conservation or would they be affected by CPT in general? Ah, good question. Um, I don't want to stick my neck out here because I don't work on, on CPT. Um, I, I would have thought there's, I mean, given that they don't, they don't conserve um, momentum and energy, um, so they, 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 they may not, but I'm not sure, to be honest with you, I'm not sure I don't work on, I'd have to think about that a bit, I think. I, I don't want to say, yes or no, because it could be the wrong answer. I'd need to think about it and whether it does affect it or not. No worries. <laughs> so you, you briefly touched on um, there being uh, the fact that the, the quark gluon plasma was not an actual plasma. Um, and, and some of our viewers may well be aware that the sun uh, and, and the interior of, of plenty of stars uh, is often classed as a plasma. Could you very briefly um, explain the differences between the two for our viewers? <clears throat> so, yeah, the, the idea is, well, without, <laughs> you can do it more complicated, but um, the, the idea is a plasma behaves uh, much more like a gas, so it's much more weakly interacting, and um, a liquid is, is much more strongly interaction. So I can give you um, an example of why we know it's a liquid. When um, two, if, if you think of the, um, the, the two lead ions as two footballs colliding, uh, in general, unless you're lucky, they don't collide absolutely head on. They kind of collide slightly off center. So if you imagine that, the fireball that you produce is more kind of oval shaped, sort of like egg shaped. Now, what that would mean is, that in in that you get different pressure gradients inside. So in in the if it's sort of that shape, this way you'd have higher pressure gradients. If it's behaving like a liquid, then you'd get a side splosh because you've got a pressure gradient. If it's behaving like a gas, it makes no difference and it would still come out isotropically. And what we can see, we actually fit the angular um, distribution using a kind of but it's a very similar Fourier analysis that's used to map cosmic microwave background, actually, and, and looking for changes in that. But when you do that, you fit it and you realize it, it behaves like a, like a liquid. Um, and interestingly, the, most people think that a perfect liquid is something that has zero viscosity. Um, but the, 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 the theory, actually, that the equation to show a perfect liquid is, is actually viscosity divided by entropy density because in natural units, that's dimensionless. There you go. And this has the smallest of that. Um, but yeah, so it really is, if it's a gas, it, it's not really interacting with the, with the particles around it, so it just doesn't care. Whereas if it's a liquid, it's dependent on what's around it and gets dragged along with the other particles. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that that definitely answers uh, and goes into way more depth than I was than I was hoping for, and actually gave me some new things that I didn't know. So thank thank you very very much. Okay. Um, it looks like we have another question on the YouTube chat, so I'm going to read that one out, um, and that is, what is meant by mass, and what do uh, massless particles have if they don't have mass? Okay. Or, there are some physicists that think the biggest mistake Newton made was coming up with the concept of mass and we shouldn't use mass at all. Well, I won't, <laughs> I won't go down that line. Um, so mass is the rest energy of a particle. So it is the energy that a particle has 
if it doesn't have energy and it's at rest, it does it doesn't exist. So it's the energy. So if a particle is massless, that means that it is never at rest. If a particle is mass, so not only does the fact that something has mass, it can't travel at the speed of light. Einstein's laws tell us that if something is massless, it must travel at the speed of light uh, in any frame of reference. And so it's never, it's never stationary because if it was stationary, it would have no energy and hence it wouldn't exist. I don't know if that helps answering your question, but um, so mass is, is really, in, in a way, as far as we're concerned, it's how much energy we need to create something. So the mass of a proton is how much energy, I, or the mass of a Higgs is how much energy do I need to create a Higgs, and that's its mass. Brilliant, thank you. And, and yes, uh, we've just seen in the comments that that has answered the question uh, oh, thank you. brilliantly. So thank you very, very much. Is it all right if I ask one more question? <laughs> Go then, I'm bracing myself again. Perfect. Um, I was just wondering, does the LHC have any experiments or to have, have they made any progress regarding the search for a graviton? So I, I don't think the LHC will ever find a graviton. Uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think anybody will. So the, the, the graviton is just there because the, the idea of forces carried by virtual particles works very well for um, the electroweak force or the weak force, electromagnetic force and the strong force. Um, gravity, I'm not even convinced of the graviton because gravity works in a different way. Gravity actually, the reason why there's not a, um, a quantum theory of gravity is that gravity actually warps space-time itself. It bends space-time. And so that, that, that gravitational attraction is caused by actually warping space-time itself. So that could be a case where I'm not even convinced. Uh, you know, I just think that gravity may work in a very different way to the other forces, and therefore maybe the graviton doesn't even exist. But I, I don't even know of any way to discover or measure a graviton, to be honest. I think uh, that does address the question quite well. They colleagues on Atlas and CMS. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the next thing they're looking for, I mean, they're still measuring the Higgs in detail, but the, the next thing they're looking for is, is obviously some evidence of um, things like supersymmetry or dark matter. Um, you know, I think the LHC does have a chance of finding some dark matter candidate. But not the graviton. I'll, I'll bet you your student fees that the LHC will not find the graviton. There you go. <laughs> that sounds like a bet I would be willing to make. <laughs> yeah, you'd, have to pay, you'd have to pay me back if it, once the LHC is finished. I mean, I'd, I'd, pr I'd probably have to pay my fees either way. So no, you won't. You won't. <laughs> not unless, unless you become a barrister or something like that, or um, or a trader in the city, then you're probably better. But, most people, I think even, even GPs don't pay back their student loans. So. <laughs> I think we have two more questions from our audience. Um, this one's from the YouTube uh, live feed chat that we have. Uh, the question goes, uh, how far do you think we are from perfectly combining the strong nuclear force with the electroweak theory? Um, so... What's interesting ab about that is that, um, in spite of what I teach you in my lectures, um, the, the strength of both the strong force and the electromagnetic force is um, energy dependent. So the strong force gets uh, weaker with high energies and the, so that alpha term on my equation actually changes with energy. And the um, electromagnetic force gets stronger at a very slow rate. So there's an idea that at a certain energy, they would be the same strength. And so you have unification of those forces. Um, it's like the weak force and the electromagnetic force is unified at around about 100 GeV. So they, after that, they are basically the same force. But if you extrapolate at the moment, um, the 
the, st the strong force and the electro weak force, um, you, you, do, you go to energies that you'd have to build an accelerator that was rough, roughly out the, you know, the, the orbit of Pluto to get the energies you would need it to, to get there. So, um, so that's a big particle <laughs> accelerator. Um, but there are, you know, when you bring in things like supersymmetry, it changes where where those forces meet, you know, if they exist. But I, um, I don't, I mean, throughout history, people will say you'll never get to the energies to do that, but certainly not in our lives, lifetimes. Um, you won't get to the energies without major new physics that you'll, you'll be at that area where you're seeing the unification of those forces. That's in, it's an enormous energy that that happens. Does that answer the question or did I go down the wrong path? I reckon that probably answered the question. Uh, I haven't got anything more on the YouTube ch chat to indicate otherwise. So that's, that's looking really good. Um, we'll go to the one in the Zoom chat, and then I think we've got one more in the YouTube chat after that. Right. So um, the one from the Zoom chat says, is the LHC capable or will it be capable of conducting research into multiple dimensions, i.e. finding new particles and expanding the standard model? Okay, so on the finding new particles, yeah, that's what it's all about. Um, so that, that's more the focus of Atlas and CMS, um, but and indirect measurements with LHC. So yes, it's looking to find new particles. And I think there's a good chance it may find something. Now, in, in terms of extra dimensions, we are looking for evidence of extra dimensions. Um, and one way that it, it might show up is um, if you could create a, a black hole at the LHC, say in a proton-proton collision. So um, don't worry about it. Tiny black holes are safe. It's only the big ones you need to worry about. So um, normally the, en the energy density uh, of the collisions at the LHC is not great enough to form a black hole. However, if there are extra dimensions which are on the scale of those energies, then they can unfold at those energies, which means that the um, gravity, instead of going as one over R squared, would go over one over R 2 plus n, where n is the number of extra dimensions, in which case then you could form a black hole. And if obviously this black hole would have the mass, um, you know, a tiny mass, it's made out of two protons. I mean, they've got higher energy, but it's, it's a tiny mass. So it would, it would vanish from Hawking radiation in about 10 to the minus 22 seconds. So it's not going to gobble up anything, it's just going to vanish but there are people looking for those signatures of you know they've modeled what uh, a black hole would look like in the experiments and they're looking for those signatures so but if you ever saw one that would definitely be a smoking gun of extra dimensions and I suspect there's other theories out there looking for smoking guns of extra dimensions too I got how is the oh sorry was there somebody in in ahead on the YouTube one because I, I can see the chap on Zoom, but not YouTube. Nice. Uh, yeah, I think we're probably going to get to the um, Zoom one right after the YouTube question, if that's all right. Um, the question on YouTube says, uh, with the time period that virtual particles violate the conservation of energy, where does the 2 pi come from? Uh, you mean, why is it h bar over 2 pi? Uh, yes, yes. So. Yeah, I think that will be hey, well, it, it, that it, question. It comes from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, <clears throat> and it depends how you calculate it. So, um, and it's, I don't know, what, have you done that yet in your lectures, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Did you do that? In first year of physics, yeah. we had it in quantum mechanics. Right. So, depending on how, if you calculate it properly, you end up with delta E delta times delta T has to be greater than or equal to H over it's h bar over two, I think. And then if you do it another way, you get h bar. Now, in terms of where that two pi comes into, um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I have seen the calculation, but it, it's it's something I would have seen as a probably a PhD student and it's horrendous. And then you have treatment and you wipe it from your mind. You remember the results. So I suspect in your lectures, it wasn't derived, was it? 
but two pi pops up all over the place in theory. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, really that's why um, H bar should be one, not H as far as I'm concerned. So, um, but it, yeah, the, I can't remember exactly. I, I mean, and if I did remember, it would take me an hour to derive it. It's, it's horrendous from what I remember to derive it from the uncertainty principle mathematically. Brilliant. So I think the, the advice there is that you can go away and find the, the derivation, but it's not worth your time and effort, correct? Yes. Well, you, you'll probably feel, um, yes. Well, I don't know. You'll probably get a place in heaven if you went through it and understood it, I think. You would certainly deserve that. But um, um, it's good to say it, it's one of those things that you've seen the derivation of before and you used to know how to do it, but you've forgotten how to do it and you don't care because all you need to know is the result and, and then using that. So. Brilliant. That's great. Um, I think we will go to the last question on the Zoom call and then we'll wrap it up after that. So the last question is, how is the mass of the quarks calculated and or estimated? Yes, so it, it's improved a lot. So it used to be, um, it, was, it was done from a mixture of scattering experiments. So uh, firing, well, for the light quarks, uh, firing uh, electrons at, at protons, et cetera. Um, but more from a fit so when you produce particles you produce there's a whole family of particles so you know with with mesons for example um if you just got u's and d quarks it's not just pions there's a whole load of higher resonance versions and there's higher resonance versions of protons that have a higher mass and it used to be you, you could fit these and extract the, the mass out of it by fitting the mass difference between a proton and the higher resonance version. But these days, um, there's much more calc um, there's much more better calculations using lattice calculations. So you you basically work backwards with the lattice. So you keep changing the mass of your of your quarks until your lattice calculation gives you the mass of the proton, for example, or whatever. Um, but it's still the biggest uncertainty is in the up and the down quarks because they got such a small mass relative to the mass of a particle. If you look at a, a B meson, that is completely dominated by the mass of the B quark. So there's not much error on that. The biggest errors are actually on the mass of the up and down quark. So when I say it's 0 0.003, um, it could be 0 0.002 or 0 0.004. There's quite big errors on, on those masses. But it's, it's now done, used to be done by looking at particle spectra and modeling it, but it's, it's now done by lattice calculations that are now got so good that they, they can really pin those masses down. That is brilliant. I think that answers all the questions we have. Um, yep, our, our panelists have, uh, or sorry, our, our participants have really enjoyed those the, the answers to those questions. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, from everybody at AstroSoc here today, um, we'd like to say a big, big thank you, uh, Professor Evans. It's been a fantastic talk and some really, really great answers to some of these questions. Always a pleasure to help Astro Sock, and thanks everybody for coming along. And uh, I'm looking forward, I'm hoping not just virtually, but you know, in the flesh of seeing you sometime <laughs> before the end of the year. So uh, that, that, that would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you. So um, just to kind of wrap everything up, um, that is the, the end of the session today. Um, the, the, the talk for next